Okay. It says live on custom streaming now. It's going now, and I think we should be good here. So we're recording, and we are. Um, I'm presenting, and so Angela Reagan. We're ready. Go ahead. I think we cannot hear. We cannot hear her hardly at all. Okay, so you're going to have to use your microphone. Does that help at all using the microphone? I can hear you fine, but I can't hear her at all. Um, I'm going to call the roll. If you guys need caught up, I can catch you up. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. We, we still can't hear her, but uh, that's, uh, you can catch us up. Suzanne Arthur. Here. Todd Ireland. Here. Scott Powers. Present. Angela Reagan. Here. Teresa Wallace. Here. We have a quorum. And for the pledge of allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any guests to acknowledge? There are no invited guests this evening. The only um, the only thing that I was wanting to ask for, which I don't know if this will go to the next time or not, but is to have be able to have 10 minutes at the end of the meeting to ask questions with whatever you guys, whatever was talked about tonight. Yeah, there are two things. We have an addendum. Um, everybody in attendance got that. Um, and then we also, I'm requesting to remove from um, personnel um, item 1B3, which is Brenda Day. Um, Brenda is currently, Brenda retired at the end of the school year. And due to retirement, she can't be approved until a later date. So um, for her retirement purposes, we're removing that at this time. And then we have also a request to add 10 minutes to the end. Um, so if somebody wanted to make that motion for public participation. So is that going to be on um, um, recording or not recorded 10 minutes after? It'll be on recording. And why are we doing that? Uh, to give them a chance to ask questions about the um, about what's presented this evening was their request um, because the information wasn't shared prior to the meeting. Okay, move it. All right, we have a second. I'll second. Okay. So Susan Art moved. Teresa seconded. Um, any other changes to the agenda? I'll call the rule. Suzanne Arthur. Yes. Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Scott Powers. Yeah. Teresa Wallace. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Okay. 
Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. And Teresa Wallace? Yes. Five to zero. Um, we will leave the room at 7.08. We're going to go to another room for executive session. We will return. There is business. Um, Jacob and Todd, then I'm going to mute the camera, the microphones here on the, um, on the recording. And then we will um, probably have to call you so you can join the executive session instead of taking the camera with us. Okay. Okay. I know that's going to probably kick you off of maybe, but we'll see. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Ray McGrath. Jay. He's not available. Todd, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> okay, Ray, Jay, I'm going to call in one more time and see. He, he went to voicemail, so give me a second. Jacob. Um, I can talk to the five of you without Jacob if I have to. Okay. Hey, I am still showing live recording on the, um, on the web here. You want me to disconnect from it? Todd, you need you should at least mute and stop your video. Gotcha. Um, I don't have very good cell phone service, so I'm going to move and try to go outside yeah. where I get some service. Yeah, it went to voicemail, so go ahead and move outside, and that okay. will help. Okay. You're, 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 we're going to go ahead and just fill you in. Um, Jacob's not joining.
Okay. Let's say, do we have a motion to move out of executive session? I'll second. And then, um, Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? We are out at 722. <laughs> Do I have a motion? Okay, Mr. McGrath, do you have anything to say about the treasurer's report? Um, yes. Um, again, we, we did have the, um, we already approved the, the prodigy um, letter of intent. That is the same amount. So we're just approving the contract now. Uh, the income tax renewal, it does say renewal, but um, we are changing that to a permanent. So I'm, I'm going to be positive and say when that passes, um, we will not have to vote on that again. We will not have to go to the voters on that again. This is not a new tax. It is the same taxes that we currently have um, to support the school district and we are asking for your continued support. So um, are, are there any questions about the income tax renewal? There were no questions. Anything else to add? That's it. Okay. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Scott Powers? Yes. Teresa Wallace? Uh, do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Um, we have those two things there. The, the work was supposed to begin this week, um, but it's been delayed for a week. So we parked in the back parking lot tonight, um, thinking there was going to be work done out front. We already, you already approved this once, but this is just finalizing that contract. This is the same amount as the quote. Yeah. Does that include the walkway for the point? Yes, it's everything. That includes the walkway from the point to the elementary and the board office. Yeah, and then includes the parking lot um, reworking there at the board office and the entire front parking lot here. Okay. Any other questions or comments on that? Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Suzanne Arthur, yes. five to zero. Um, please note that the next sections here will go through one by one to get specific board approval on the individual components. So. So this is where we get into the, uh, the plans that we've been working on here. So you all have um, board yours sent this ahead of time. Um, we have been working with the Green County Public Health, other Green County schools, um, and our school attorney to make sure that what our policy is complies with the current guidelines, but also um, American, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, you know, some of these medical conditions that we're gonna have to be uh, cognizant of for staff and students may qualify under a disability claim. So we have to make sure we have plans for all of those things. So, um, I will go over um, some of this. If you have questions or comments, um, board, let me know. And then, um, so the 
the definition of a face covering obviously covers the mouth, nose, chin, um, and staff will be required to wear a face covering at all times that they are around other staff members or students while in the building. That is currently a requirement in the state of Ohio. Um, if they have a medical condition um, or a recognized exception by the Department of Health, then they can be excused from that. But we as a district have to provide documentation to Department of Health to document that exclusion or that exception. Um, we have been given um, face shields. So they've changed this instead of a mask policy to a face covering policy. The face shield complies. These were actually built by Ford. Um, they donated to all the school districts. Uh, we have um, face shields that, uh, these are pretty durable. Um, we're working with Department of Health right now and providing uh, masks. Um, I've been told that like IHS pharmacy, you can go get one for free right now. Um, these white ones and we've been given um, 500 of these white ones to begin with and there's a stockpile with Department of Health that we continue to have the ability to draw from. Um, so if you're a, uh, a family and you don't have a face covering, I know that um, right now you can get one for free at the pharmacy here in town, um, but also uh, staff members have those opportunities as well. Um, a staff member is an inclusive term and includes but not limited to all salaried and hourly employees, vendors, contractors, and volunteers. Um, so if we're bringing somebody in to work in the building in any capacity, uh, they're going to be required to wear a face shield at that time. Are there questions about the staff portion of that? So these white masks, right now we're going to keep the extra masks for students um, that need them. Um, we will, we're looking into providing um, a mask um, for staff. We have the shields will be for staff members because we have some. So an exception of that would be, for example, a bus driver. They're an employee, they're required to wear a mask, but there's a safety exception there because if they have glasses, the mask may fog up, it can't be unsafe. And so there will be exceptions that we have to account for. For example, a bus driver, um, the, the bare minimum at that point in time is masks on and covering nose, mouth, and chin while students are loading and unloading. Um, but while driving, if they, if they qualify for one of the exceptions, they wouldn't have to wear a mask. The second part of that is a staff member um, working alone in their workspace. So if they're on their planning period, in their office, in a workspace, are not required to wear a mask during those times. Um, and so that's the staff portion of the face covering policy. Any questions about that? During instruction, During instruction, they have to have a face covering of some sort unless they have a one of the um, exceptions. And the exceptions are listed in one of the other documents. Yes. Any other questions on the staff portion of the face covering? Um, the student face covering policy. Um, the student face covering policy, uh, students must wear a face covering while on a school bus. There's no way to socially distant on a school bus. Um, we're gonna be sitting two, maybe three kids in a seat depending on the capacity of the buses. The recommendation right now out of Department of Health is that when social distancing is not possible, then face masks should be required. Um, they, uh, that's the recommendation. When social distancing is not possible, face masks should be required. So st all students will be required to wear a mask on a district bus, um, in the hallways or common areas of a school building. Um, so moving from class to class at the middle school and high school, um, or as we're moving about at the elementary school and we're taking an entire class to some other function, um, because they're going to be in the hallway and social distancing is not uh, possible at that time in the comments areas and hallways and while working in close proximity to other students and staff in the classroom. So if a teacher is working with a student one on one in a special ed class or something um, and they're going to be inside of the six foot radius, then the face coverings would be required. What is not required is if a student comes into a classroom and sits down, they're able to take the mask off. Um, so it is not 100% of the time, it's not masks all day long. So we're going to wear our mask between classes. We're going to wear our masks in the bathrooms. Once you come into a classroom, 
you're eligible, you're able to take your mask off during the duration of that class. It won't be required at all times. Um, lunches, mask will not be required at lunch. Uh, we'll cover that, but right now it's going to be every other seat in all the cafeterias. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that in a little bit. Um, students may be required to wear a face covering um, if the district is placed into a watch category and the Greene County Public Health requires um, face masks or face coverings. So if we get to a red or a purple level and we're still in school and they require face coverings, then students may be required at that time um, to, to wear a face, uh, face covering. If a student has a medical reason or some um, you know, exemption to that policy or to those face coverings, um, they have to provide documentation to the building principal and they can wear a face shield, um, they can wear a mask, um, or we can make accommodations to make sure that that is in place. Um, this, is, this is one of the things that was added um, at the request of our attorneys to make sure that we comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act for staff and students. Students may be urged, and we're using the word urged, okay? We may be compelled um, to wear face coverings in particular school settings to protect other students or staff who are particularly vulnerable to the COVID-19 transmission. If we have a medical reason, say we have a staff member who is medically compromised and they're choosing to work, um, it may be required or they may be asked to wear it while in that staff member's classroom um, in order to make sure that they, they don't compromise the adult or another student who happens to be in that room who may have a medical um, reason for that. There are exceptions and requests for exceptions under section um, can be provided documentation to myself or my designee and um, we will work then through the exceptions to the mask policy. So for students um, on a school bus, in the hallways or common areas of a school building, and while working in close proximity to other students. So a science lab, for example, they're all gonna be around one set of equipment and inside of a six foot radius, a science lab would be an example where proximity is a problem and that would be a required uh, activity to wear a mask. So are there questions about that from the board? Yes, yes. what is your question? Uh, Yeah, so the governor said three through 12 is the um, should category um, and K through three, it's recommended, but they didn't fall under the heat, you know, K2 is um, they can wear them on, but three through 12, it should, right? Um, what we found in meeting with our staff on this, particularly at the elementary school, the classrooms are smaller um, and class sizes may be, may be larger. And so... Um, we're talking about the common areas and some of those activities. So this, you know, an elementary classroom in kindergarten, for example, that may be circle time where they're reading and the kids gather in a section of the room or something along those lines. Um, we're still, and we'll get to this in a little bit with classrooms and how they're going to be organized and ordered. Um, we felt like in those situations, even though it was a could and a should, um, you know, distinction from the governor's office that uh, the consistency that we have a greater concern about social distancing at the elementary than we do um, in the other buildings because of the size of those rooms. Okay. Any other questions or comments about the face covering policy? Do I have a motion? Suzanne Arthur. Second. Teresa Wallace, um, Angela Reagan, yes. Todd Ireland, yes, Scott Powers, yeah, Teresa Wallace, yes, Suzanne Arthur, yes. motion passes. Do I have a motion to for this? Who was that? Sorry. Scott, a second. Um, second. Okay, so you have this as well um, for the community and for anybody watching at home. Um, we'll be sharing this with you, and the links um, will be available. Uh, they're active on there, um, and we'll get that out to you. So we have two different things. First of all, um, 
is this document here. Everybody sees that one. Um, community. The, the, this section here is broken down by individual sectors of the building. So for example, um, you know, we're, we address classrooms, we address hallways, we address restrooms, we address cafeterias. So we've gone through each individual space in the facility. And I'm going to highlight some things based off of questions we've received in the last couple of days. Um, and if there's anything specific that you want to look at board, you've had this for a couple of days now. Um, I can look at that, but I wanted to talk um, briefly about the classrooms. Um, we went over face coverings in, in the last section, so I'm not going to keep touching on that in each one of these. They're consistent throughout. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in here specific, students in grades 5 through 12 will be asked to clean desks and seat at the conclusion of their class. So before they move to the next class period, um, we will have cleaning supplies in the classroom. Um, you know, clean up your desk and your chair that you were just sitting in. That gives it a chance to sit a little bit between class periods. Um, and then that was one uh, thing that were, you know, in case droplets or things were left. Teachers are going to be orienting classes in the same direction. So, for example, all desks will be facing towards the front of the classroom and trying to get as much physical space as possible. We won't be facing students face to face in a, in a classroom. Um, we have ordered this week, um, we've ordered new desks for elementary. So all kindergarten classrooms currently have tables and four or five kids are sitting at one table. Um, we've, or, we've bought desks for our kindergarten classrooms and the two fourth grade classrooms so we can maximize that space. We've asked teachers and we will be asking teachers to remove any of those extra things in their classroom that take up space. So if we have you know, multiple tables around the room that we use for breakout types of activities. Um, the goal here is to get as much space between desks as possible. And so um, all desks will be facing the same direction and we're looking to um, remove any of that extra furniture. Uh, that's typically a good thing in a classroom that we have for those things. But under these circumstances, we're asking for that to be removed. Um, students will be assigned to an assigned seating chart it's really important that they obey the signed seating shirt and that we adhere to it because if somebody is positive for COVID-19, we have to contact trace. And so if somebody is in a seat and they're positive, we need to know who was within six feet of them. So a seating chart um, is really important for that. So students will be assigned to a seating chart um, and staff members need to keep record of that um, seating chart. Um, we're going to try to do our best to maintain physical distance whenever possible, but in those situations where it's not possible, that's where the request for the mask will be put on. Um, we're going to attempt to eliminate or minimize the use of shared classroom materials, furniture, and equipment. So, for example, in the classroom, we have the bucket full of pens and pencils and crayons, right? We're going to make sure that we have our individual sections of those things um, that we're not using um, shared classroom materials or furniture or equipment, if at all possible. Um, the second part of that is, for an example, in a high school art class, we, we don't have a paintbrush for all 300 people, you know, kids in the high school at that point in time. And the paintbrushes will be cleaned, but may not, may not be disinfected between each use. So the requirements and what we're looking at is that we clean our hands as often as possible, because it's not always possible to make sure every surface is sanitized or disinfected. So we're going to do our best to clean surfaces, um, but the, the other thing, you know, for a computer, per, you know, computer, you shouldn't spray a computer disinfectant. Um, you wash your hands uh, before and after using the computer. And so those are things that become common practice. Um, that is sort of what a classroom will look like this year um, and, and what that may look like. A couple other things, um, lockers, we will not be doing using shared lockers. We're asking students to not, you know, uh, buddy, buddy up on a shared locker. All of our buildings, um, the high school and middle school have enough lockers that everybody should have their own. Um, in the past, we've shared at the middle school, but some of that was because um, there were more on the second floor than the first um, or vice versa. I'm not, I can't remember which one that was. Um, but in the hallways, um, we're asking for those things like that to be uh, the case. Um, when standing in the hallways, like at the elementary, if you're lining up to go do something, we stand along the walls 
that way to allow people to, to have passage in the middle of the walls. Um, most of the grades at the elementary school will not be doing group bathroom trips anymore. Um, you know, we normally line up all 25 kids and we go to the restroom. Um, that may still be required or necessary for kindergarten, first grade, but we will have the opportunity now and I'm trying to cut down on the amount of people standing in the hallways. Um, water fountains will be um, shut off, but we have replaced or will be replacing um, and every water fountain in the buildings in the classroom section will now have a bottle filler. So parents, we're gonna be asking you to send a water bottle to school with your children and the bottles can be filled up from the no touch bottle fillers, but the water fountain that you push the button and you drink directly from the faucet, um, those will be covered up or turned off for the year um, or until further notice. Any questions about hallways, lockers or common areas? Uh, these, these things are, they're much more in depth than what I'm covering, but I'm trying to hit some of the highlights there. You'll see this parents as you look at some of those things. Um, the, the big one for us is transportation. We're gonna talk a little bit about transportation in a separate item, but um, the parent drop off and, you know, uh, and buses, we're gonna have to maintain order and try to stagger those things as much as possible to get people into the plane. So I'm gonna talk first about buses. Um, Students, we covered the face, the face shield thing on buses. As much as possible, we're gonna fill from the back to the front of buses, trying to keep as distance as much as possible on the bus. Um, and once again, we're gonna ask our bus drivers to assign a seating chart based off of when they would pick kids up and staggering those things to the front to keep as much separation as possible on the bus. But parents need to understand their child will be likely having to sit with somebody else on the bus um, and uh, if you have a sibling, we're going to make siblings sit together to try to keep those households together. Um, and students will need to sit in their assigned seat, remain seated, face forward, trying to direct the flow of, of everything in the same direction. Um, and we'll be filling the buses from the back to the front. Um, all of this is going to require a lot of planning and coordination for our staff members. Seating charts, the flow of how classrooms happen. Um, it's not just a classroom, our bus drivers are gonna have to do that as well. Um, and so those are some of the things. Um, buses will be disinfected once daily and cleaned and wiped down another time throughout the day. So we are um, in the process of purchasing um, disinfectant that you spray and leave and it will stay on the seat in between routes while the buses are seated. And then one time every day, um, the drivers will then be washing or wiping down the seats as well. So they'll be cleaned twice throughout the day, but once thoroughly disinfected. We use that spray gun to tell what kind of care we want, anything that makes them look always. And then, I mean, it makes you look well. Not that yeah, we have backpack sprayers on order. And so um, those are some things that we will be uh, looking at in terms of safety protocol. Um, our goal is to keep kids as far apart as possible. So if we're talking about within six feet for 15 minutes or more, that is our requirement for contact tracing. So if I sit the first two kids on the bus for an hour and a half, okay, I've, I've now got a problem, right? My goal is to keep the first two kids six feet apart because they're gonna be on the bus for the longest amount of time together and continue to stagger that with assigned seats and then we go back. So the goal would be maybe that we don't have people within six feet of each other for that long by staggering the, the, the logistical um, order, uh, ordering of the buses. Okay. I know transportation is a big deal. It's a bit, I mean, it's, it's a big deal to us. Um, it's the one place that we know we cannot socially distance. Um, and uh, so we're gonna do everything we can to, to try to do that. But um, those, are, those are risks associated with that. Um, the second thing along with that, and, and then I'll get to Scott, your question about food service in a second here. Um, parent drop off times, we're going to still be having that. It's not going to change currently for the elementary school, but if an elementary student rides the bus, when they get there, they notify the bus driver, hey, I eat breakfast, if they eat breakfast, and they'll report directly to the cafeteria so they have the opportunity to eat breakfast. But we're going to hold the kids on the bus for the few minutes to make sure that we we don't load up the gymnasium with all 450 or 550 kids at one time. 
Um, and so we're trying to reduce the mass gatherings. So the elementary students will be held on the bus for a few minutes once they get there and released in staggered locations and in staggered times beginning at 850. And they'll, they will report directly to their classroom once they leave the bus. The high school and the middle school, this is all outlined in these plans. The high school and middle school um, would also have the same thing. Student pick up or drop off can't happen until seven o'clock. Um, and that's when our buildings are staffed with adults anyway. And then bus drivers um, won't release their kids unless they're eating breakfast until 7.05 or 7.15. And those kids will go directly to their classrooms. So we're gonna have to coordinate that and that will be a process. I mean, student drop off time is always a process, um, but it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be constantly having to, these plans will change. Um, they will change. Um, these are all based off of guidelines and recommendations from Department of Health. Um, I am making a recommend, I, I have um, consulted with Premier Health Partners and Fidelity Healthcare. I'm gonna shift gears to nurses for a second. I've requested a nurse at the high school full-time and then Mrs. Warnock will be at the middle school full-time and Mrs. Hassid will be at the elementary full-time. So we would have a full-time nurse in each facility this year to deal with what we had to do for health services. So that we will see an increase in our health services contract with Fidelity. Um, we have some COVID uh, money coming from the, federal, from the federal government passed through the state and we'll be utilizing, I mean, that, that will, be, it will be spent. Um, and that's the type of service that's allowed to be spent on. Um, at this time, we are not, we are not allowed to host um, events or gatherings. So um, open house will have to be done differently this year. We can't have everybody in the building at one time. Right now, the plan for open house is people new to the building will have a dedicated time. So a kindergarten will have open house, fourth grade will have open house, or fifth grade, I'm sorry, will have open house, and ninth grade will have an open house because it's a new facility and we're trying to take some of that edge off of them. Um, we're gonna encourage uh, digital remote, uh, maybe by appointment if there are other needs that happen for open houses. Um, at this time, we're not allowed to have uh, programs, concerts, things like that in the buildings. So for large gatherings, um, we're not allowed to do those things as well. Um, and so we're gonna be cutting down, we're gonna encourage parent-teacher conferences digitally um, for the time being. If they wanna be there in person and don't wanna use Google Meet, then we can set those up, but they would need to be socially distanced. So, I mean, just thinking through all the logistics of what have to happen. Um, at this time, field trips um, are not recommended. And so field trips will be minimized throughout the year to reduce the risk um, the goal in all of this is we have to do the best we can to contain our environment and protect kids while they're here. And taking a group of kids to COSI, for example, um, one of a field trip that we've done in the past, is introducing them into a new environment that we have no control over. And so um, our goal is to stay in person as much as we can, in school, in person. And so some of these things that, we've, that we love that we value, that are good educational activities for this year, um, you know, are going to have to be things that we consider not doing. This plan outlines a lot of those things. And parents, I know you have a lot of questions. This is 17 pages. You're gonna have all of them answered, um, okay, uh, I think. So um, cafeteria, let's do that real quick. Um, cafeteria, the the lunch times will be staggered to not have overlap between grade levels. So fourth grade will eat in the entire cafeteria, seated every other seat. Um, we will mark the chairs. These tables will have four people at them. We'll mark the chairs. Every other chair, um, the recommendation from public health, we have enough seats in our middle school cafeteria that students can sit every other seat and not directly across from each other. So we're going to be diagonal. We're going to zigzag down the table and all students would have a chair in the cafeteria. Um, that's four to four and a half feet apart from each other in the middle school cafeteria if we're every other chair. At the elementary, we're at four, three and a half to four feet staggered um, in those spots, but we have enough room for all kids to eat. The request, the biggest request was don't sit kids directly across from each other at the cafeteria tables. Um, 
lunch options. There will be no like salad bar. There's the, the um, you know, the golden corral type of setting. You can't reach in and grab your own food. It will be packaged. Um, you know, they're going to cup up. You want a fruit, it's going to be wrapped. Um, all of those things. So it's going to be labor intensive to protect and make sure it's safe um, ahead of time. We're asking, uh, you know, for those things to be, uh, you know, we've met with not only the public health department, but the health department that does our cafeteria inspections to make sure that these things um, comply with what they're requesting. In between each group, the tables will be wiped down um, and disinfected and um, the, uh, the staff in those spaces will be wearing um, proper face coverings while preparing and while serving the food. Um, and, you know, students that pack will be asked to be seated furthest away from the lunch line. So the kids that are standing along the wall um, won't be standing along people beside people that are already eating. And so we'll fill the cafeteria towards the, towards the serving line as we go. Um, and then, you know, we are, um, we are asking also, um, you know, in the past, we've allowed parents to come and eat with their kids. That's something that we're going to have to disband that for the year um, because we a, won't, will not have physical space for parents to sit in the cafeteria and eat with their children. And, um, and B, uh, we don't know if that you know, adult is, is sick or not. We're not going to do the same level of health assessment on them or things like that. So um, I, did that answer your question on food service, Scott? Cafeterias? Yeah, um, this cafeteria, we may have to go to three lunch sessions at the high school. I was going to say, because if you look at those tables, you can do everything you want to do right across from each other. Yep, and I only get, and I, but that table is like, I don't know. Six feet in diameter. I mean, that's four to six feet in diameter. So you're across from each other. You're you're at it, right? But um, but the every other seat, the the horizontal is is that. So um, the custodians and and I I would tell you I've met with all the custodians. First of all, they do a fantastic job. Our buildings are um, are excellent shape, um, and they've done a great job this summer. Um, and they're going to have a big job ahead of them um, to to make sure we do things to keep kids in in each other safe. Um, in the same way that we're asking parents not to come and sit and eat lunch with their kids, we're going to be restricting visitors to the facility as well. Um, so for the year, if you're bringing your kids, you know, lunch, uh, you know, birthday snack, um, the request for the year is that it's prepackaged snacks, not, pre not prepared for you by home. And it's dropped off in the office, not taken directly to the classroom. Um, not allowing the visitors to come into into the space while students are present um, and those sort of things. So um, restrooms, public health policy requires that restrooms are cleaned every two hours. Um, public restrooms are cleaned every two hours. So um, we will be setting up a schedule where we clean and disinfect those restrooms every two hours. Um, the maintenance custodian, uh, the maintenance supervisor um, Mr. M Mr. Brandenburg is on the agenda tonight for a custodian position. Part of that change in his responsibilities this year is because I need extra people to just clean the buildings throughout the day. Um, and so those are, uh, that is something that will be there for him as well. Um, public restrooms will be cleaned. Student restrooms will be cleaned every two hours throughout the day. Um, we will still be having recess. Um, we think it's important to get outside and play outside is better than inside. And so as much as possible, we're encouraging teachers to take classes outside during educational activities, but also we'll still be having recess. Um, at recess, children are not required to wear a mask outside. Um, we are gonna ask them to wash their hands before they go because they're be coming from lunch or you know, classroom and wash their hands when they return. And then once daily, um, we're required to disinfect the high touch area. So we'll be wiping down the handrails you know, between sections, maybe, um, you know, the slide railings and things like that. Um, so we'll have any shared equipment will be minimized. Um, but if we're, if we have a ball out there for, you know, Gaga ball or something, right. Um, then it will be wiped down in between grade levels uh, that the people on the, on the playground will be doing that. Um, indoor recess may be in the classrooms, but right now the administration wants to still have it in the gym. 
So the problem would be now we have 150 kids in the gym. So indoor recess, um, depending on what the activity is, may be required to have a mask on during that time because there is no way that we can socially distance um, for indoor recess. But we still believe that those breaks throughout the day are important. That will be up to the individual activities that are happening or scheduled for that day. Um, the last uh, gym classes, we're still going to have PE. Um, right now they're working on providing activities for PE that are non-contact sports um, and changing the things that we're doing. So in the same way right now you can play softball, baseball, tennis, um, golf, you know, they'll be seen doing things like frisbee golf, disc golf, can jam, something that's, that's non-contact as much as possible. Um, cornhole, those sort of things that are allowed, but there will be times, obviously, we're trying to try to get outside as much as possible for that as well. So we're still having recess, we're still having gym. Um, the, the big change is this, and I wanted to make sure the board, you understand this. This is, I met this morning with all music teachers in the district. So on the, there's a page that says band, choir, and music. Um, the recommendation from the, from the public health department at this point in time is that we discontinue choral music or choirs for the year. Now, the reasoning for that is because the current CDC guidelines for singing is 13 feet of separation instead of six feet of separation because you take deep breaths in and you exhale, exhale really deeply, often spitting while singing, um, all of those things. Um, what I am making a recommendation is this, and this was um, our staff uh, met this morning about this and it was well received, that elementary music will still take place, but it will not incorporate singing this year for their curriculum. So Mrs. Pickering is looking into percussion, movement. Um, one of the things that's been suggested is possibly even purchasing um, piano keyboarding lab and each kid would then have the opportunity to um, to learn, you know, we'll be giving them basically piano lessons in that time or space, if that's something um, that's been offered to her um, as well. So we won't be doing any singing in elementary music. We think about a, a 25 or 30 kids in our music room, there's no way the separation is even six feet, let alone 13. Um, band is one of those things that if you take a year off playing an instrument, um, it's really detrimental. Um, the requirements for band right now are the same as singing. It's a six foot separation. So middle school band and high school band will still be happening, but their, their practices will be moved into the auditoria here or the cafeteria at the middle school. So we can socially distance those activities. So band will still be taking place. Middle school choir um, will not be happening this year because they have 30 to 40 kids in those classes, um, no matter where we are. We can't get that separation, but those students who signed up for that will be given the opportunity to take another elective or um, we are working on purchasing um, equipment so they would learn. They're going to work on music and production in some way. Um, Mr. Gonzalez has some ideas for that. How is the band going to work with the hallways open doors of the classroom? The band... Um, well, the doors of the classroom, that recommendation is during passing periods. So in the same way tonight, we didn't want everybody touching the same door handle. We're not saying that all doors need to be open every period. I thought I read where the classroom doors were. That's, is, that's when students are entering and exit. So not every kid touches the door handle. Okay. Um, there's not a requirement for, the, for them to remain open during class period. Um, and so band will be taking place in middle school and high school. They'll be moving to the auditoria and the cafeteria at the middle school. High school choir, our numbers are such that we can still offer high school choir. Um, a big part of this is not taking an experience or an opportunity away from kids. So we have a senior that this is their last opportunity to participate in the choir. We wanna make sure that they have that opportunity. And with 20 kids in a choir, we can utilize this space here and be separated. Band and choir do not take place at the same time. Um, and so we have the ability to socially distance our high school choirs in a way that we cannot elementary or music or, or middle school. What happens to the kids that haven't been accepted into sensations? They will still have the opportunity to be in sensations. If you choose as a parent to not be in a choir knowing the risks, then we, they can take another elective. High school choir is still going to take place this year. 
um, and it will be moved into this room um, for, for rehearsals so we can socially distance. <sighs> Are there any other questions? There, I mean, when you read this ahead of time, did you have anything that you questioned? I've covered, I think, the highlights of what I wanted to cover here. And we'll get to the other things that are on this um, in another section. Anything else? Um, so, okay, so then this is the next one. And I promise these are the long ones. So um, the next one looks like, um, and parents, uh, those watching, um, all of this, and this is, like I said, um, it's actually 14 pages, but um, we have taken all of what the parent or student expectations are on this. So, you know, what it, what it is that we're asking parents to do and what it is we're asking students to do. So it's all boiled down to one section and it's on a one page deal that will be linked as well. This, this is the specific for each section of our facilities and activities. And this is the boiled down two pages of expectations. Okay. Um, and that was shared with the board. You guys have that as well, but it's not new information. So the health and safety guidelines, um, I can go through a couple of these, but we have to comply with five things with the health department. One is a vigilant assessment of symptoms. Um, we're going to ask to partner with parents on that. We do not have time um, to uh, provide each kid every day with a thorough assessment of their health. So we are asking to partner with parents and parents are gonna be asked to, before you put your kid on the bus, before you drop them off, make sure that they don't have any symptoms, that their temperature is not over 100 degrees. Um, and you know, currently, you know, we, the students that we have that are doing this, they, it feels like a respiratory, it's a, I thought I had sinuses, I thought I had allergy problems. It's, it may not be the barking cough that we thought this was at first. If your child is sick and their fever is, is nearing 100, we're asking parents to do that assessment in the morning before sending them to school and keep them home. Um, when children arrive at school and they get to their homeroom classes, so elementary, middle school, and high school, each classroom will be equipped with a thermometer. So I know that you put a kid on a bus at 6.30 in the morning and by 7.30, things may change. Um, so we're going to partner with you and we're going to check temperatures only. Um, and we're gonna walk down the aisle. We have the infrared no touch um, thermometers and every classroom will be outfitted with them. And any fever that is above 100 will be sent to the clinic to speak with the nurse and the nurse who is a healthcare professional will then assess symptoms and, uh, and decide what to do with that student, not the classroom teacher who is taking the temperature. Um, we're, not, we're not going to ask 10 questions to every kid um, in the morning. We're gonna take temperatures they have a fever, we send them to the office. Um, that's, that is our responsibility. This document outlines what happens if children um, are, are um, diagnosed with COVID and the steps in order for them to return. Um, we're asking also from parents that when you call and let us know that your kid is sick, you may speak to the nurse and they may ask you some things, you know, do they have a fever this morning? What are the symptoms? They may then can maybe assist you in deciding whether you should see your physician or not. Um, and in those conversations, you know, we, we're not trying to probe, but we do need to make sure that we are a partner in that and assist with helping parents make decisions. If there are no other symptoms other than a fever, students can return to school after being fever free for 24 hours. So we know that kids will still get strep. We know they'll still get sick with something other than COVID. And, um, you know, if there are no symptoms or they're not positive for COVID, we're, we're implying our same, applying our same thing, 24 hours, fever-free without, without medication. Um, if they test positive for COVID, um, according to the CDC and the Department of Health in Greene County, these are protocols we had no choice over, three days with no fever, that's 72 hours with no fever um, and without taking medicine, and their, all of their symptoms have improved, and they've been 10 days since their initial onset of symptoms. So it's a 10 days from the onset of symptoms, and you also can't be you know, symptomatic at that time. Um, that's the first one, vigilantly assess um, symptoms. 
The second one is wash and sanitize hands to prevent spread. We are going to cover our building with dispensers and opportunities to cover uh, to wash our hands. It will become a regular part of what we do. Um, washing our hands frequently is going to be something that we do. A lot, a large majority of our middle school classrooms have sinks in them. You know, if we're doing a shared activity, hey guys, we need to wash our hands. You know, or they ask them to wash them on the way into the classroom, things like that. Um, we have some high school and middle school classrooms that have sinks and we'll utilize them because we can't all line up at the bathrooms to wash our hands throughout the day. Um, we will have hand sanitizer available. I board for your information. Um, Green County Public Health has um, secured a 55 gallon drum hand sanitizer and refillable dispensers for us. Um, and uh, those are things, but we're also purchasing things to have throughout the facilities. Um, Hand dryers will not be available in our restrooms. It will be paper towels only, trying not to blow around the germs. Um, so there'll be paper towel dispensers. Um, they won't have to use their clothes, but we aren't gonna use hand, sanitize, or hand dryers. Um, and then there are specific things outlined in there before and after they eat, after they return from recess, after they use common equipment like the library, computers, art room supplies, gymnasiums, things like that. There'll be specific times where, the, where they have to wash their hands throughout the day. Um, thoroughly clean and sanitize the school environment to limit spread on shared surfaces. We have to demonstrate how we're going to clean the facilities. Um, the current recommendations are that all surfaces that are touched by students are cleaned and disinfected at least once every 24 hours. So student desks, um, and chairs and equipment used by students will be will be cleanly it will be cleaned and sanitized each evening by night custodians. The priority is going to be student desks and chairs for them. We'll be empty and trash. We'll be sweeping floors. We'll be cleaning bathrooms, but there may be other things that shift in their responsibilities. Um, we may not mop every night, for example, or things like that. But we have to have the high touch things done. Buses will be cleaned and sanitized daily, like we talked about earlier. The high school and middle school students before they leave their class will wipe down their desk at the end of the period. Custodians are required during the day to clean um, public restrooms once every two hours. So that will be happening. Water fountains, uh, we talked about already. Um, we will provide each staff member with cleaning supplies, with gloves, with things to make sure that they are not you know, that we're not exposing kids to the harsh chemicals. We, we will use kids safe things. Um, and um, elementary students, we're not gonna be asked at this point in time to clean their own desks and chairs off. Um, they're using their own chair throughout the day. It's not changing for six other kids sitting in the same seat like a high school or middle school would be. Um, Physical distancing requirements, we talked about this uh, um, in other sections already, but we're gonna have to add signs and distancing reminders throughout the building. We're gonna be encouraging you know, students to walk on the right-hand side of the hallway um, to keep from face-to-face -face, uh, contact and interaction. Um, the high school students will always tell you they can tell the freshmen in the first month of school because they walk on the left-hand side of the hallway. By the time you're a sophomore and you drive a car, um, you don't do that at the high school apparently. Um, and so we're gonna have to teach some of these things. We will have to teach routines. We're going to have to teach kids and reteach and, and reteach routines throughout the year. Um, student desk uh, will be asked to face in the same direction again. And we're trying to limit class sizes as much as possible. When tables are unavoidable, middle school science, for example, has science tables. Two kids sit at a table. We are purchasing plexiglass dividers that will be in the middle of the table. So when they're sitting beside each other, they cannot be six feet apart. Um, they, we, we will have a divider. In other spaces, we're trying to <laughs> shared tables, okay? Um, uh, the other thing specific to this, this document covers bus distancing, cafeteria distancing, things like that. Um, that is, that's that section besides what we've already talked about. The face coverings we've already talked about. So those five sections, face coverings is one of those five things.
that was a lot of information. It will all be available on our website for people to begin reviewing. But I wanted to make sure that we have public health approval, which we do. We have board approval, which we will need. And it's all been reviewed by our attorney to make sure it complies with requirements. And so I'm asking, do you have any questions on those two documents um, or comments or changes that you would like us to consider? Board. I'm good. Correct. I will deal with the remote learning plan in a second. Okay. The end of this document, for those that were asking, the end of this document deals with what happens with online learning or blended learning. So we'll cover that in a minute. Okay. Do I have a, I have a motion already, I believe. I need a roll call. Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Scott Power. <clears throat> Wallace. Yes. Suzanne Arthur. Motion passes five to zero. The remote learning plan is a requirement from the Ohio Department of Education. It is sent to you, it looks like this. There is no new information in here. This is the, um, I have to load this into the system. So it's not anything different. This is, these are the things we must do. Um, so I will talk about our remote learning plan and what these two options are. The one thing I shared this week with the, um, with the community, was the educational options. So parents have the choice of two options. One, knowing what the expectations are in the facility, knowing what is social distancing guidelines, knowing the cleaning, knowing all of those things. Um, if a parent chooses to send their school to that, their child to school and what school will look like this year, um, we're calling that option one physical attendance. Our goal is to stay with in-person physical attendance for 100% of our kids as much as possible. And we believe in meeting with our staff members. We believe that our parents survey that we had, they want them back in school um, and uh, they, want, uh, they want staff members working in, with their children. And staff members um, are asking, I, I would rather be here. Um, please find an option. So physical attendance, would be as much as possible 100% of our students here in the building. Should we get to a situation where we begin to see a spread in a facility or a classroom, say we have, and I'm gonna throw out a number, this is not a number that's given to us, but hypothetically, we have three kids in one second grade classroom that are now positive with COVID. The health department may say to me, Mr. Stevers, we have a concern about this classroom and the number of children that are outside of the same household that are now positive. And we may be, we may be required to self quarantine and educate from home that one specific classroom. If it's in a wing of the building, they may say your first grade has way too many kids that are sick right now. We believe that you need to do that or it may be for the entire building. The goal would be to have as many kids not disrupted as possible. Um, and so if we can, then there may be portions of students um, that would be remotely educated. That falls under the remote education plan. A staff member may be quarantined at home with their second grade classroom. And for two weeks under that quarantine period that's imposed by the health department, they would then be working with that group, that their students at home. If the child is sick, then, then their deadlines are extended, they're sick. If the child's not sick, we're just waiting to see if they get sick because of a quarantine, then the expectation is that's school for that two weeks. Um, if they get to a point where they say, we're starting to see an increase and we have concerns, we want you to make sure you have the maximum amount of distance possible under the physical attendance policy uh, po um, option, option one of physical attendance, Remember the goal is 100% attendance. It may be that we have a half capacity so I can ensure that in the classrooms, I'm six feet apart. That is the 50% model that was ex explained in that document where a red students would be assigned to a group of blue or red by last name. So my last name is Seavers. It is after K in the alphabet. We chose, we looked at buildings, 
We looked at grades, we looked at the entire district and the balance of that was between J and K was the cutoff. So A through J is blue. B, blue falls in the first part of A through J. So that's why we chose blue for A through J. K through Z is red. R falls in the second half, we chose R. So if you forget which one you are, um, think for blue or red and where does it fall? JK is the cutoff. Um, we would have 50% capacity. So the students that are in person would be doing work with their staff members and the students that are home would be doing work at home. It's not a day off for them, it's just a different activity. And when they come to school physically the next day, they would be doing the in-person activity while the other group is at home the next day doing the remote learning activity. So staff members would be required to come up with two in-person lessons a week and two and three remote lessons a week. Due to feedback from staff and talking with Mr. Hayes about the old rotation of um, kindergarten model where we rotated days, we are choosing not to have that fifth day um, alternate. Originally, we were going to have some kids come three days and some kids come two days. That was confusing when we did it with kindergartners. It would be massive confusion for kindergarten through 12th grade. The second thing is a lot of our holidays that are scheduled days off of school are Monday. So we're going to make Monday the flex day and students will come to school on Tuesday, Thursday or Wednesday, Friday with Monday being the flexible day. It may be possible that if you're a gifted student and you have gifted pullout classes on Monday, we may still have gifted students come on Monday because they wouldn't have the opportunity under that um, thing to have those, op those, those activities. Um, it may be possible that intervention specialists who need to provide additional resources to kids in an IEP, that they could come on those Mondays and provide those additional resources. Monday will be reserved for online learning for, the, for most kids and intervention and enrichment opportunities for some kids by appointment, by designation. Um, that, is, that is obviously better than the all remote option. Not as good as 100%, we understand that. But it's a step between what we did normally and what we did last spring. Physical attendance may be 100% in attendance. It may be 50% in attendance. <laughs> Dire, dire circumstances where we get shut down because we're under purple, then physical attendance may be remote for a period of time where all kids do what we did last spring and we're home for a period of time. If you choose option one of physical attendance, then you're choosing the expectations of coming to school that we've just spent half an hour talking about. And you're choosing, I know there's a risk with sending my child to school. Um, there's a risk in, in being infected. There's a risk in that. And you're also choosing that this may change from one day to the next, depending upon where the cases are in our community. They are not directly tied to the color system. So just because we're yellow right now, or we may be orange, or we may be red or purple, the only thing that we've been told by public health is hmm. if we move to purple, we will be remote learning between 100% and purple is a decision between the superintendent and public health officials. What are the numbers that we see in your community or in your buildings right now? We'll be reviewing our attendance rate. What's an acceptable number of absences based off of what's normal absences? Um, and those things are, uh, that's, it's gonna be a daily conversation quite honestly on what, what they're seeing when they report things. Um, so remote, um, the remote learning plan covers, we have to have a plan for how we're going to, going to assess work. How are we going to provide professional development for our staff, which is the reason I'm asking <clears throat> you to consider changing our school calendar start date because a requirement is professional development for staff on remote learning. And then the third, uh, then that is option one. Is that, and are we good on option one? I know there were questions when it was put out on the document. Does that thumbs up, thumbs down? Does that help explain for those in attendance what option one is? Okay, option two would be, you are not comfortable sending your kid to school. 
or you're not comfortable with the requirements that we have to follow in school, or you do not want to have the in and the out, I'd just like to know. Option two would be a 100% virtual option. Please understand this is not what happened in the spring. It will not be a Greenview teacher teaching your child through the computer. We have contracted with Green County ESC. It is a purchased program. Um, it is designed for virtual learning and online homeschool learning. It is, it is a purchased program. They work through the entire Ohio curriculum for that grade level. There's two different ones. One focuses on elementary, one focuses on middle school and high school. The support is responsibility of the, of the district. So we will have teachers that maybe sign up for, I will be the math tutor if anybody needs help in virtual learning and I'll be available between three and four where kids can come in and get help. We will have to support their learning, but it is not instruction by Greenview staff. Okay, so those are the two options. And we understand that both of those options, um, one of those options may work better for you and your family. And we get that. And so um, if that's the option that you choose to get virtual, I will say right now, this is a pandemic response. We are not going to become a virtual school in the future. Um, our goal is to offer this during a pandemic. And then in the future, we would return to, to normal school operations. I read it right. I can't Once you sign up for that option, you're in it for a semester. So if you choose to go virtual, then you have to stay virtual for a semester at a time. Um, we understand that you may get into it and realize it's not what you thought it was going to be, or it's difficult and that sort of thing, but we can't, we're going to build our class schedules to balance them. We're going to build our bus routes to accommodate those things. And we can't be flopping in and out. Um, in extenuating circumstances, if somebody chooses the in-person option and then a health need arises, they may have the option. If we have capacity, we have to purchase a certain number of seats. If we have seats available, then they may have the option to go from in-person to virtual in the middle of a semester, but not the other way around. Okay. Um, and the remote learning plan must be filed with the Ohio Department of Education. And it's really what we've discussed in our um, option one and option two of educational options. Does that make sense or any questions on that as a board? Okay, do I have a motion? I would. Sorry, go ahead. If we would happen to go to all remote, they, give, they tell us to go to purple. Yep. Yeah, I'll ask. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. So they can only hear my answers. Okay. Okay. So my question is, if we go to purple, full-time remote, yes. is there going to be stipulations to the staff to have regular set hours? No assignments after 4 o'clock, no assignments... Yeah, so, so what we would, what we heard is this, and, and so the question was, will there be expectations and stipulations given to staff on when assignments are assigned, when they're made due, how communication happens? The answer to that is yes. So um, what we heard through parent feedback during the shutdown and at the end of the shutdown was we need one communication platform. I know where to go for things. We are purchasing a communication platform that is one thing. We, every student in kindergarten through 12th grade will on the first or second day of school will be logging into Google Classroom so they know that their assignments are coming through that place. They know how to get into it. Parents know what the login is. We will be sending out assignments and activities through Google Classroom and setting deadlines and expectations. Our communication um, in some of these documents, and I can't point to it at this point in time, um, right off the top of my head was, you know, our goal even in 50% remote learning would be that we let students know at the beginning of the week what the remote learning activities are for the week. So they have the opportunity to work on them throughout the week. We communicate by this time on Monday, assignments are out. You can stagger those deadlines. 
So those are expectations that we have to work on with staff. That's part of the remote learning plan is how are we gonna monitor progress? But a one single communication platform, some people use Class Dojo, some use Remind, some use on class, some use Google Classroom, some use emails, some text. They're all over the place. Um, we are gonna be Google Classroom and the prescribed um, designated communication platform and expectations for that. The second part of that is unless shut down by um, the government and not allowed to report to work, um, our plan at this point in time is should we go remote that teachers would be working from their classrooms during regular contract hours so they're available during school hours for students. Um, that's the plan as we sit today. Actually, I will say to you in conversations with some staff committees, that was a request that they made. So some of them worked longer than normal, um, a lot longer than normal, right? And if I can tell parents and students, I will answer your questions between eight and three. If you email me at 11 o'clock at night, you'll get your answer between eight and three the next day. Um, so those are for staff and for parents and students, that is an expectation that we need to communicate and clarify. Um, and that's one of those things, yes. Anything, other questions for that? Yeah, I just think that after four o'clock is kind of, it is a Yeah, and, and in, in assigning things in the evening that are due the next day and a student doesn't log in and see that uh, is, is you know, that's unfair to a kid that, that is getting an assignment in the evening, but it's due the next morning. So. Those types of things, we're gonna to have to work that out and it's gonna be building specific because they know their kids, they know the types of assignments. Um, it's not realistic to have a deadline at the end of the week for all activities. I mean, I, I'm a math teacher and it all builds on each other throughout the week. You can't make all assignments due on Friday afternoon and they may have done them all wrong because they took the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday assignments in order. So um, that is something that, um, uh, that's something. Any other questions you have about remote learning plans or the educational options? Do you have a motion? Nope. Scott Powers moves. Second. I'll second. Suzanne Arthur seconds. Uh, Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Scott Powers. Yeah. Teresa Wallace. Yes. Suzanne Arthur. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Their addendum items are there. Okay, so um, on the back table, you guys saw this. If you came in, there are copies if you didn't get one of these. Um, the, the, the move right now in Greene County, and I, I'm gonna explain why this is happening at such a time like this. Um, we need to give parents the option, now that they are gonna be able to understand what option one and option two is, um, and setting a deadline for them to sign up for one of those two options and to opt into transportation. Right. If you're a parent and you know that transportation is something that you're considering um, and knowing that my kids got to wear a mask, they may sit with other people, you know, all of these things. Do you still need transportation? We're asking. I'm, I'm going to ask all parents, if you can transport your children to school, I'm asking that you consider doing that um, to reduce route times and to reduce um, uh, just, you know, numbers of kids on a bus but we're going to ask parents to opt in to option one or option two and to opt into transportation. Well, once we have that information, we have at least two weeks worth of work to set bus routes and change class schedules and all of those things. It is not realistic based off of when we got our information from governor DeWine's office a week ago to make these decisions now in a three week period. So I'm asking, and the major changes on here, if those looking at it, staff would still report on the 17th. We would have six days of professional development. The reason um, we do that, we, we, have to require, we have to provide professional development as a part of our remote plan. Um, we understand some of those things. I'm also, uh, to be completely honest, the fair is happening in Greene County on um, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, somewhere in that range. Um, understanding that large gatherings of people may be problematic for people becoming infected. So that gives us a 14 day quarantine window after the fair. 
I'm asking, I'm pleading, if you want to come to school, be careful at the fair. Um, don't let us start on red um, to begin with, right? But this, this serves a couple purposes. A, it gives professional development time. B, it gets us further away from that large gathering congregate time. And it would allow us the second part of this. And I'm right now just asking for these days. Please know that we moved first quarter down one week to try to keep 42 days in first quarter. Just pointing that out to you. The all quarters except for third are 42 days long. But third quarter is where we have the majority of our snow days, ice days. And it's also during the peak of flu season. So even if it's 48 days, it likely won't be 48 days. Um, so I try to balance the quarters. I got rid of the um, late August, late start or early release for students. And I also got rid of the one at the beginning of December, trying to maximize classroom time as much as possible in those two hour delay or two hour releases. Um, and then right now I'm asking for the first student day to be August 25th. Um, almost every school in Greene County is making the same recommendation for the same reasons. I don't wanna be unprepared on day one. As we sit right now, that will be a normal attendance day, but one item that may change in the next two weeks or four weeks, it may be that we transition into school that first week to teach students the protocol and the activities so I may be making an announcement, I'm saying this now, after we have time to consult with our staff and our administrators, um, some districts are transitioning in with only 50% of their kids for the first four days. Give them an opportunity with half the kids in your class to teach them when we wash our hands, to teach them how to get on Google Classroom and to do those activities. So as of right now, I'm just changing the, the, the attendance days. It may be that we announce um, those days to be 50% capacity. So the, the red and the blue, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then to come back on August 31st as a normal attendance week. Student orientation. Student orientation and it's like we do with kindergarten where we transition them back into, into a school setting and we teach them routines. The reality is a senior in high school is gonna have to learn something on the first day of school this year that's, that, that's gonna take a little bit of time and attention. So um, I would request that we that you um, you know approve this change. It doesn't change our staff work days. It doesn't change when we're going to ask aides and cooks and things to come to work. There will be work for all of our staff on those weeks. Um, it changes the number of student attendance days for the year. Okay. Um, any questions on that or comments? Uh, Scott Powers moves. Do I have a second? Teresa Wallace seconds. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Number seven. Okay, so um, this is something that I am proposing based off the recommendation from the Ohio Pupil Transportation Department. Um, it has always been the law in 3327.01 says this, that kindergarten through eighth grade students that live within two miles from the school um, are not required by law to be bused to the school. Um, Currently, we bus everybody no matter where you live. Um, across from the elementary school, we pick you up. We stop traffic on 72 and we pick you up. Um, high school, it is not a requirement of law to transport any high school student. Um, I am making a recommendation, and if you need more time to consider this, I understand, and we would, could maybe consult. I'm, I'm making this recommendation to you but understand that this is a significant change from what we have done, that we implement no transportation zones. So um, for example, the neighborhood across the street from the high school is our largest transportation zone in the entire district. We take more kids home in that neighborhood from the middle school and high school than we do from any other neighborhood um, or location. 
Um, we have two buses that drop kids off and almost empty their buses across the street from the high school and the middle school. It is within two miles to walk from anywhere in that neighborhood to the high school and anywhere in that neighborhood to the elementary. I've reached out to Greene County Parks Department, Mr. Dobney, and requested if they would grant us access to extend the sidewalk between the soccer fields and the hospital, that we could add a sidewalk through, um, so those of you who are familiar with soccer, right, close to the fence that's next to the helipad there, outside of the soccer area, so it would go from the parking lot to the middle school. I'm the, the middle school, sorry. Sorry, middle school. Thanks for the clarification. That's a long walk to the elementary, okay? I'm talking about a parking lot from the, Seam, uh, the Seaman Park parking lot to the middle school along the fence line there. Um, it would go not on the pavilion side, but on the, the doctor's office side. Yes, yes. That, that pavilion parking lot. That would give us from any, par any house in the, the plat across the street it's less than two miles to walk to the middle school and the high school. Um, that would, and I gave you the numbers in here, you see the map, um, uh, that zone there from the high school. Um, so we, would still pick up elementary. we would still pick up elementary because it's outside of two miles to the elementary. So it would be a different zone for high school, middle school. And it's even a different zone. So from the, the homes that are beside the Walmart, or no, not Walmart, McDonald's in that area, there's that neighborhood that backs up to the bike path. That's within two miles walking distance to using the bike path corridor to the middle school and the high school. Um, those are large group gatherings that probably get the equivalent of like 50 or 60 kids off of a bus or two buses or three buses that allow us to disperse the kids out. It's well within 3327.01. And we would do it to where they're not crossing the main roads. Um, we are working with the Silver Creek Township and the village of Jamestown. Um, they're going to extend, and it may not happen before school starts because we're working on government you know, paving project time. But the sidewalk out of that neighborhood through that yard is going to be extended and a flashing light crossing uh, school zone sign will be added at the entrance to the high school, notifying people that that's a crosswalk for school. Um, all of those things go in conjunction, right? We're thinking about how to get them safely to school. Even if a middle school kid has to walk to the bike path by the shelter, by the uh, baseball fields, down the bike path and back in, a large percentage of them could still walk that path, but we don't want them to have to go to the bike path down and back. We would rather add the sidewalk through the park if possible. Um, that... Um, they, they, would, they would have to find a ride to school or they're still going to walk in it. I mean, it, some, some schools in Greene County don't transport high school students at all. Um, yeah, yeah, it, we, we couldn't drive a bus on inclement weather days. It may be possible, may, may be possible to offer a shuttle from the high school to the middle school. Those are options that we will consider depending upon how many kids sign up for transportation. Okay, that, that's the neighborhood those are the two neighborhoods that are impacted by that. We would, we would have to put out a map and say, if you live on these things and you do that, if that's what the board would want to do. Have we talked to the police department about patrolling those areas? And so, so the question was, if we talked to the police department about patrolling bike path or those areas in the morning and afternoon, um, the, the answer right now is no, but the request would be that there would be a presence on the bike path, obviously, during those times, because if it's dusk or, you know, if it's dawn or dark or whatever, we want to make sure we have safe ways to school. Okay. Um, the, that, that would be, and you can see on the map that I provided you, the high school. Um, the high school is, is really the neighborhood across the street, and those on um, Southern Boulevard, um, that's pretty close to where that connects there behind the baseball fields on the bike path um, and Sergeant Drive for the high school. The apartments and the things on the south side of 35 um, are within the two mile walk radius to the uh, middle school. And so there may, would be designated spots for that. Um, the elementary, 
and this is a little bit trickier, but the elementary, the goal would be to find, to carve out a section that they don't have to cross 72. Um, and and we, want, we want to not have our resolution more dangerous than the original problem, okay? But a large percentage of the elementary students that are picked up live in that neighborhood close to like the fire station. Um, and there's sidewalks all the way to the school. The paving project will be done by then. And we would position a crossing guard um, at the corner of Limestone and South Charleston Road with a sign, you know, a flashing red stop sign thing for crossing guard section. Um, we would ask if there's any staff members like we have that, you know, work sessions in the morning. Do we have anybody um, that does that? We would position those there. Um, we've seen, you saw there 41 bus, 41 students that fall under that category um, at the elementary. So I'm making an original recommendation to you. Um, if you would like more time to think about it and see what our numbers look like, if you're okay with that decision this evening, if you need more information, um, that is a recommendation that came to us and we ran the numbers and tried to give you those sections. Are there any questions or comments from board members about that? Nope, I'm here. Um, would you, um, do I have a motion to approve that recommendation? I'll move. Todd motions to approve and Susie seconds. Um, Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Scott Powers. Yeah. Teresa Wallace. Yes. Suzanne Arthur. Um, like I said to you in my recommendation, um, if our numbers dictate that that is not a necessity, then we will begin by adding those things back in. Um, the second part of that um, recommendation is under law. Um, we would be um, looking at our bus stops where we allow open enrollment students right now to drive into the, into the community and get on a bus stop. We're not required to permit that by law, so we'll be notifying them that open enrollment students would not be able to grab a bus in the district, even if their parents drive them to a bus stop. Um, if you're open enrollment, you're gonna to have to be transported and the law permits that. And, and I will come back to you and it's, uh, um, so Scott uh, Powers would like to know what um, the police chief has to say about that recommendation. If, if, it, if we deem that not to be safe to do, um, this is going to allow us to build the routes this way, but I will come back to you and say we decided that wasn't the right option based off of our discussions with the police chief or how many kids would impact. Um, you have the numbers on how many kids would impact now, and we would begin with the youngest grades first, adding the transportation back in instead of the older grades. Okay. I think that's it. I believe, I believe that my section is done. That was a lot of new business. Do I have a motion? Scott, second. second. Susie, 
Um, I'm going to explain some things here. So it's sort of on the record of what's going on. The first two employees were retire, rehire employees and those contracts for assistant mechanic maintenance or mechanic um, were not offered for the next year, but we offered them the summer um, contract to, for the transition. And so they um, had the opportunity to work for those two months and um, or take their, vaca their accrued leave make sure that we have a transition time. Um, Jay Brandenburg is currently um, working because if you remember last month, we approved the resignation of JP Carter, our maintenance supervisor. And so Jay Brandenburg is keeping some of those summer projects going in that role right now. Um, Hersey Lumen Jr., as we know him, um, Jr. has served with us for well over 40 years as our mechanic and um, our buses are ready to go for the school year. And he's taking some much deserved time off um, in July and August right now. That was his original goal anyway. Um, and uh, so that's what that limited contract for a period of time is there. Um, Andrew Myers, uh, support specialist, that's a new position we created um, that will help take some of the burden off of Thomas Davis and doing some of those things. Um, Jay Brandenburg is not coming back as the mechanic and maintenance person but will be the extra custodian that we've hired to rotate and float and, and provide additional cleaning support in the buildings for the year. And uh, that step is because he, he is entitled to his years of experience in that classification. Um, uh, Brooklyn Dean is a new bus driver. Um, and then we had uh, internal transfer. So I, I think it's important to note for our public, we had several vacancies this summer that we have chosen to replace um, internally and shuffle and combine some positions. So we had an aide position that opened up in the elementary school and we replaced that person with a current aide who was no longer needed. So we, we saved the position there um, from what we had last year. Um, Cynthia Rutherford was previously our transportation secretary and um, she worked 223 days and it was uh, fewer hours in a day than this. But with how we can structure it, we can have her still fulfill her transportation roles, but from the high school office. And then when she's not dealing with transportation calls and some of those things, then she's gonna be here at the high school to replace Kathy Carr. So we were able to take two positions and combine them. And um, the 223 days, 10 of those will be dedicated specifically to transportation before school starts. And then once school begins, she'll be here at the high school um, and, and dealing with parent phone calls, all of those things that happen during transportation times. And um, we've worked with uh, the other two secretaries at the building and one of them will get an additional half an hour um, on their day to make sure that we have it all covered. And then another secretary will get an additional hour. And so all three of them at the high school now be eight hours. Um, and, and we believe through the transportation and with Mr. Kasner here at the high school that we can still satisfy all of those um, job duties that are needed with those three people. So it was a way for us to consolidate positions and save them. Should it not work, right? And it doesn't, and it doesn't work, we've told Mr. Morgan at the bus garage and Mr. Kasner, then we will replace um, one of those positions and we'll go back. But right now we believe that this would work. So it's a way for us to try to be fiscally responsible and especially in, in, in the times that we have right now with reduced budgets. So um, nobody was laid off or reduced um, in, as a result of all of these things, but we've been finding some creative ways to consolidate positions. Okay. Can I ask a question about three? Correct, yes. It's supposed to be 19, It's supposed to be 2021, I believe. I read it and then I wasn't um, that is a misprint, and if for some reason that it's wrong, it's supposed to be 2021. If it's some reason that's wrong, we'll go back and do it again later. If it was a catch-up from a time before. Isaac, is that Lori and Lori and, uh, Lori and Jake? Lori and Jake, is that was that wrong on the agenda? 1920 school year. Also, we didn't okay. we didn't approve them before. Is what you're yeah, yeah. Um, so the 1920 was correct. Okay, so 1920 was correct. We must have missed them before. So in order to pay Lori, we have to approve her. Um, right. Lori's in attendance for anybody. So, okay, any other questions? 
Um, any other questions that we have on the on these items? Nope. Um, Suzanne Arthur. Yes. Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Scott Powers. Yeah. Teresa Wallace. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. That's on the agenda, correct. Do you have any additional questions from those in the audience that we did not answer? One is. I know you said we had enough lockers for middle school and high school to not share. Are they going to not have lockers at the elementary because they share currently? They currently share. And the question was, we well, have enough lockers. I don't have to change the microphones. Maybe they can do it. Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, the question was, we have enough lockers at the elementary. Will they not have lockers or will they not share? Um, our goal in all of this is to make sure there's a place, a, a single place for one kid to store their things. Right now, we're using a lot of our lockers for um, classroom supplies and things. So that we will prioritize the students having their own locker and whatever's remaining. We may not have enough lockers, and if that's the case, then we'll provide something inside the classroom for their storage. Okay. Uh, my next question was, are you going to have to shorten lunch times in the elementary in order to stagger wash hands before, wash hands after, such and such, with the extra hand washing that it takes, you know, um, kids to do? The plan right now is to not shorten lunches in the cafeteria. We have a minimum requirement for lunches for service time, and so we cannot shorten below the minimums. The, uh, the they may be taking is 20 minutes, I believe, mm -hmm. is the state minimum for, for food service. Um, and so the goal, we cannot drop below that. Um, and so that is from the time they show up in there, right, to the time they leave. Um, the elementary is going to specifically work on the logistics of lunch and recess. It is possible, I'm saying possible, um, that recess will happen before lunch. So they wash their hands on the way in and then they get their lunch box into the cafeteria. We have some staggering of that. Um, there's one idea that's being thrown out right now. We cannot show below the minimum for okay. food service, um, so we'll make sure that they have the required time. Okay. And my last thing I wanted to ask about was an IEP for the remote learning program. If we choose to do the remote learning program, the option B or two, I don't remember. Option yeah, two. <laughs> yeah, all, all, all online, if you're asking. Yes, all online. How does, like, say our kid falls behind in the semester because he doesn't have it, he's not at school to be. So, like, I'm concerned because Jax isn't performing to what the third grade tests are going to yeah. require. So, so, the question you have is what are, <laughs> will they be providing and what happens? Yes. Them? Yes. I'm right. Important answer that I want to give you that everybody else can hear. Too, okay. So we've been talking about special ed services in the remote learning plan. We're required by law to provide special ed services in the remote learning plan. So if you choose remote learning, we still have to provide services. So our school psychologist, our special ed supervisor, you will remain on a caseload for the grade that which you would have been. And if you qualify for speech therapy, you still have the access to speech therapy. Currently the plan is, that would be done through tele telehealth, like we've done so far, right? Mm -hmm. so we log in and we do the face the time, whatever that thing they look like. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry. Somebody's providing feedback. Um, Currently, the plan is to use telehealth like we did in the fall. So in the sp I'm spring, in the spring, we couldn't meet with kids face to face. We had to provide services through the internet. And um, if you choose the remote option, that's likely how the basis for how that would be. If a child is falling behind, it's our obligation to meet those child's needs. And if that means maybe set scheduling the Monday, right? If we're on a 50% model, those types of things would be done during that time or um, you know, meeting with meeting with a student. 
So um, there will be there will be accommodations that have to be med, made, and these learning programs provide accommodations. They have the ability to, um, and so it will be our responsibility to manage that. There will still be an IEP meeting and all of those things that have to happen. There's still a Greenview student. Our, our goal is this. Our goal is that as many students that, that are currently Greenview students remain Greenview students. If we don't provide an online option and people go to look for that elsewhere, um, we wanna provide the same level of care and support for our families and our kids that we provide now. It's just gonna look different there. So there's still a Greenview student. If you participate in, let me use cross country, right? And you wanna be online school for the year, you're still a Greenview student. You still have the ability to participate in cross country. You still have access to Greenview services and, and things. Okay. Yeah. So currently like the middle sixth grade through 12th grade is using Ed Mentum's Ed, Ed Mentum and kindergarten. That's actually fifth, sixth grade through 12th grade is Ed Mentum and kindergarten through fifth grade is using the Lincoln, Lincoln learning software. Um, so what we will do is um, you will have to opt in and notify Greenview and then we notify the ESC. I know that some parents are, have reached out to the ESC and wanting information. Um, we will provide more information in the next you know, week um, when we have that more information, but it is something you're gonna notify us and then we tell the ESC and we get you set up, okay? So we have one more coming to the microphone here. I'm gonna switch the mic. Okay, I have a question about busing. How many kids, I know you said you're gonna group siblings, but how many is required on the bus? Is there a limit? There, there is a limit by the bus manufacturer standard. So the limit on a bus, like for COVID right now, there is no limit. For COVID. Okay. The busing is one of those things they told us we know we can't be socially distanced okay. um, because we can't uh, we can't provide enough buses to be socially distanced. We are also choosing not to add dividers, showering, shower curtains. I mean, I've seen people like, no, we're not going to block the view of the driver. Right. We're not going to create an unsafe environment for kids. Um, that's the reason that masks are mandated in one of us. Okay. Um, because there is no COVID limit on a bus ride. Okay, second question, busing. You said, you know, first kids get on, they go to the back. What if you have a kindergartner? Because I don't want my five-year-old on the very back of the bus, even though if there were siblings, I don't think that's a very safe option. Um, so how would those you- Those would be situations you'd have to discuss with the transportation department. Okay. And if there's some other arrangement that can be made, Okay. The goal is to fill and not have as many people walking by kids that are already sitting on the right. bus. So if I walk on the bus and I talk and I'm walking by you, well, that's that's right. that's the goal of loading from the back of the front. Okay. Um, I know traditionally buses load from young kids in the front to older kids in the back. Mm -hmm. um, under this arrangement, there may be other kindergarten kids in the back of the bus. Okay. Um, it won't be all fourth graders in the back of the bus and for one one kindergartner. And, because it's based off of where they get picked up. So those are things, the things that you would discuss it would be a week the beginning, right? Which of your bus driver is with um, can that be accommodated? I don't know sitting here right now that okay. Um, my other question, you said that you were the elementary were gonna take things out of the room. What if you have sensory kids who need objects like to calm down or to fiddle with? How are we gonna the provide the kids? What I'm saying is um, for example, an elementary classroom, and I, this isn't one specific thing, but if an elementary classroom has, you know, a fifth of their classroom that has carpet and a couple of little reclining chairs and beanbag chairs, okay. that created a reading center in the corner that's eating up one fifth of the classroom. Now my desk has to be closer together. Okay, just want so some clarification. Things that are on chairs, if there's a chair that needs to be, you know, all feet, those things will still be there. If that's the equipment that's provided to the student. Okay. We're talking about the the, the 
reading those in the corners or the extra, you know, the four extra tables that are squeezing kids together. Okay, I just wanted some kind of clarification yeah. on that. Thank you. Well, anything else, anybody in attendance? I'm going to make some of the statement here just before we go. Like, I um, would like to thank our staff that have worked on um, the plan. Um, we, we have had a staff committee that has worked um, multiple times and reviewed things, and um, we're willing to provide good input and insight. Um, the, the second thing is um, this is a difficult decision for you as parents, uh, and, and I want to remind you that I'm a parent too. Um, that this is a decision for us as a district to protect the health and safety of our staff and our students. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, but as a parent, I know I'm sending my kids to a place where people care about them and are gonna do everything possible. And so I'm, I've worked hard to make sure that we have a plan that responds to those things. Um, you're talking to board members that have kids or have had kids in our district or grandkids in our district. And um, so I just wanna thank those parents that have provided input. Um, I know this plan may not be what you want, but we've tried to be reflective of our community and understanding that um, we have a responsibility to protect everybody and an edu a responsibility to educate everybody. And that we chose a plan that we believe um, listens to your feedback. Um, that there will be breaks for your kids throughout the day. That they're not gonna lose recess and gym and the things that they enjoy about it, but we're gonna have to do it safely. And um, it may not be exactly what you want, but we listened and we, we took those things into consideration and I appreciate um, constructive feedback on those things as they come out. Um, and the, and the second thing is, and the last thing, I guess, is this will change, okay? This may change before August the 17th. It likely will change before August the 17th, okay? It will change, and we will keep you informed as soon as we can. Um, I hope you'll see when these things comes out to you tomorrow as parents, it is thorough, and it took time, and there's the reason we didn't put it out before. Um, and so... Uh, I appreciate the feedback from our people. I appreciate the involvement of our staff and the willingness to, to make tough decisions. We have staff members that have health compromise, health compromising situations and they're, they're choosing to be with kids. Um, and so we're gonna be respectful of that. Um, and we're gonna be asking for respect and, and for people to do their individual responsibility. And um, we're gonna think before we act. I meant those three things when I sent them out last month. I, we need a respect for each other. We need responsibility to do our part and we need to make um, informed decisions and reflective decisions. And so I just appreciate um, your willing to lead and provide feedback and our staff's willingness to be involved. And um, we've got four weeks and, and it will modify and change over time. We will update that page Anytime we notify, we make a change and we'll notify people there's a slight change, there's a new requirement, there's something else. Um, and so uh, I, I just I appreciate it and I appreciate the opportunity um, to work here and to do this job. That's what I was going to say, Isaac, not to interrupt, but I mean, I want to make sure that everybody knows that none of these decisions have been made lightly and that he's been working around the clock. You guys, this is not stop. It's a lot of a lot of changing, a lot of efforts, a lot of rules. I mean, we've got it at work, we've got it at schools, we've got it at home with our kids. I mean, it's it's ever changing. And, you know, he's worked very hard with the team and all the people here. And I mean, as you mentioned, I know a lot of us have kids or grandkids. It's, it's not ideal, it's not what we want, but it's up to us to make the best decisions for our kids. So I, I hope that that's come across clearly. I mean, I really hope that we've done a good job communicating the 4,000 pages. Man, it's a lot, and I know it's a lot, and I tried to at times boil it down into smaller sections for you. Um, it was like 27 pages to begin with, and our staff me is like, they're done on page one. Um, so I split it into five different page documents. You know, it, it is thorough, 
and I didn't cover all of it tonight. So please read it. Um, yes. Thank you. We worked hard. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, our, our goal in doing this, right, we understand our community. I, I do. I understand this community and we're not other places in Greene County. There is some unifying parts of this plan um, across the county um, and there will be changes in other places and um, we will be responsible for our decisions. And um, the other part of this is I, I'm asking, like I did earlier, to partner with parents. Um, I'm asking that you, you take it to heart. I understand it's difficult to take a day off of work if your child is sick. Um, the alternative is a bunch of children sick and school shut down, um, right? That is, that's the request I'm making that we take this seriously. Um, the second thing is, um, it's only just begun in terms of our responsibility that when we have a sick child or a sick adult, our responsibility to help assist in the contact tracing, um, we're not shutting down for one sick kid. We will have sick individuals in our community and we'll have sick people in our buildings. Um, our job is to keep it from spreading to other kids as much as possible and to honestly participate in contact tracing efforts. Um, to be honest about where you've been and who you've been around because it's the best way to protect each other. Um, and we're going to have to provide information about seating charts and activities and all of those things in order to help um, make sure we make the best decisions for that. And so in the same way we're partnering on the front end to say, please check your kid's temperature and make sure they're not sick. If they do become sick, um, I'm not turning the in. I need to help. Right. Well, if we ask questions about health and safety of kids, it's because we want to make sure we have the right information. Um, and, and so we're going to ask a lot of questions and we're going to we're going to ask for input on things. And we may need you to work with contact tracing and you in, in the public health department. Um, I would like this to be over as soon as possible. Right. And we all have a job to play in that. So um, I just again, thank you. Um, for the opportunity and thank you for um, your feedback and we will um, share this information with parents the plan is this weekend I mean a lot of it is here um, and we've talked about almost everything so it's out but um, when we put it out to parents and families um, there will be a deadline to sign up so the last thing is before we adjourn please follow the deadline please sign up choose your option. And if there's an additional form that says, I'm sending my kid to school and I'm willing to take the RAM pledge on what that means for them and me, um, you're not signing away your rights. You're just saying, I acknowledge there's a risk and I acknowledge we're gonna follow through on our part. Um, and, and so pay attention to those things when they come out because that's gonna be information that we have to have by a deadline in order to be prepared for school. So. Um, that wasn't on the agenda, but I apologize. So thank you. I'm good now. Do the motion. Yeah, a second. Uh, Suzanne Arthur. Angela Reagan. Todd Ireland. Todd Ireland. Are you ready to adjourn? You're muted, but I think he said yes. Scott Powers. You Three, mute. You mute. Yeah. Uh, we have, we have five zero. I got you, Todd. I saw your hand gesture there. Okay, we are adjourned. Yes. At Nine ten. It's earlier than I thought. Okay, give me a second to stop all of this and to.